recently, VCY took a mystery trip to Chicago. We had uh, beautiful deluxe accommodations in a motor coach, uh, met at a church parking lot that was graciously provided, nice safe location for people to park their vehicles, and we all boarded to take the trip down to Chicago. A lot of people are interested in some of the church history in Chicago, but very few people like driving through Chicago. So I was able to host a tour as we were able to explore some of the church history within Chicago. One of the most unique figures in the early 1900s was an evangelist named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a baseball player who was saved at Pacific Garden Mission. He had, was wandering by and heard the music, came on in, and realized that he needed a savior. As we made our way down through the interstates of Chicago, just off of the Kennedy Freeway is the Forest Home Cemetery. At the Forest Home Cemetery, we took a brief hike through the cemetery back towards a section of the tombstones, and there we found the grave of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday is buried there along with his wife. Uh, his wife's sister is actually buried not too far beyond his grave. His wife's parents are buried a little bit over. What's interesting on tombstones especially is people leave some kind of meaningful thought, uh, some kind of concept. What do they want to be known for? On Billy Sunday's tombstone is written the verse, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Great way to summarize. What do we want our life to be known for? Life often is just a dash between two dates. Billy Sunday made a great testimony of living his life for the Lord. We hopped back in the bus and headed downtown Chicago for a nice lunch stop at Chick-fil-A. Making our way through the city, you can see the Sears Tower, many of the other landmarks in downtown, and headed our way down to the University of Chicago to the Oriental Institute. University of Chicago was started by John D. Rockefeller in the early 1900s at the Oriental Institute, gathered artifacts from around the world, different expeditions. They worked out deals with their host country that they dug up two significant monuments. They were allowed to keep one, and the other one went to the host country museum. Of the artifact that went into the Oriental Museum, you saw many different pieces that were just whole highlights of ancient archaeology. The Lamassu, the giant winged bull that you will see in the palace of Korsavad, Sargon's palace. Uh, surrounding the palace, you see just these giant, bigger-than-life figures. Could you imagine entering into this palace of this great king, and here you have these giant figures designed to intimidate people coming into the, into the throne room here. You can even see some of the carpeting. They actually had ancient carpeting that was used to be able to design and uh, to fill up some of the atmosphere here. You know, they didn't have uh, traditional carpeting like we have today, but some of the stonework. You also have some of the features from Babylon. The Ishtar Gate of Babylon was a beautiful entryway. You can see it in some of the pictures in that blue arches that you have, that this massive entryway into the city of Babylon. Most of the Babylon Gate is in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, but parts of it, two of the glazed lines, you can see there at the University of Chicago. Also, we have a replica from the British Museum of the Hammurabi Code. This is one of the oldest ancient legal systems out there. Many people in the old days used to say that Moses couldn't have come up with all the laws that he had, and you didn't have advanced legal systems until they found Hammurabi's Code. What's interesting, though, is the difference between Hammurabi's Code and Moses' Code is that Hammurabi's Code was based on your social position. If you were a slave and you slapped uh, someone that was a social elite, you could be executed. But if you were an elite and you killed a slave, you just had to pay a fine. Under the Mosaic Code, punishments didn't matter upon your social caste. God had one standard for everyone. As we continue through the Oriental Institute, uh, one of the highlights is the Sennacherib Prism. This Sennacherib Prism, it's a six-sided kind of clay object written on with cuneiform writing, was from the time of Sennacherib. Sennacherib marshaled an army to bring against Hezekiah. If you go over to Israel today, you can see the city of Lachish, the, the mounds where they built the siege ramps up. Uh, Rabshakeh was, was Sennacherib's deputy that was sent on ahead while Sennacherib was fighting at Lachish, and Rabshakeh went off to Jerusalem. In this Sennacherib prism, you can read on here where it tells that he waged war against Hezekiah and he demanded bribe money, and Hezekiah paid the bribe money. The bribe money came in, but it wasn't enough. Sennacherib kept waging war. This was during the same time that Hezekiah built the tunnel to help insulate and protect the city from the attacks of the Assyrians. 
Sennacherib is continuing to wage war, brings his army of hundred, over 100,000 troops. As they're pouring in, they're waging war. Hezekiah prays. Finally, you know, when all else fails, pray. And Hezekiah prays. And God says, I will deliver you. And God struck the army of over 100,000 dead. Sennacherib writes in his prism that we surrounded Hezekiah. We trapped him up as a bird in his cage. And then we left. Also nearby, you see the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser. This is a full-scale replica from the British Museum. What you find on this Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser is something that you will not find anywhere else on any other object that we've uncovered, and it's a carving of an Israelite king. Under the Second Commandment, the Israelites were forbidden from making graven images of themselves. They were forbidden from uh, building monuments. David could not build a monument to his defeat of Goliath. But what you see on here is King Jehu. Now, this is not an Israelite monument. This is an Assyrian monument. And if you look closely, you can see King Jehu bowing down and kissing the dirt in front of the Assyrians. God had offered to set up a dynasty for Jehu, but Jehu disobeyed. Instead of having an everlasting dynasty, Jehu is recorded for all of history, kissing the dirt. We left the Oriental Institute and we headed back down to Pacific Iron Mission. Uh, as we pulled up in front of the old lighthouse, we see the sign, Jesus Saves, at the center of it. Also the sign mentioning that it's the home of Unshackled. If you hear the program, you know the address, 1458 South Canal Street. And so our group uh, unloaded from the bus, excited to get in. Uh, you've been hearing about Unshackled. And their mission statement is very significant. If you look at their mission statement, this shows what their purpose is. Their purpose is to reach the lost with the gospel of Christ, helping their guests become fully functioning followers of Christ. They take people, whatever place they come in, to make them a fully functioning follower of Jesus Christ. And the Unshackled story tells about that. Uh, when we got to the mission, they gave us a little bit of orientation in the hall. They gave us a tour of the dining hall, where they serve hundreds of meals a day, over a thousand meals a day, actually. They showed some of the facilities where some of the people stay, the bedding, the, as well as the tools to be able to make sure that things such as bed bugs don't, don't occur, and just some of the precautions and safety, that this is how they share the love of Christ with people who need help, helping them with their temporal needs and their eternal needs. We headed back to the auditorium to get ready to watch the production of Unshackled. The goal of being able to bring change to people's lives, and he did this because his heart and mind and life we're unshackled. We hear it on the radio and we see the 30-minute excerpt. We assume that it's just pretty easy, but watching all the different aspects all coming, piecing together, made for an incredible opportunity. Went to the dining hall, had our dinner, and then returned for the praise and worship service, where we were able to hear Pastor Phil Kwiatkowski. On the bus, as we talk to people coming out, the highlight of every trip is hearing just the good gospel preaching, because it's the Word of God that changes lives. So please join with us next time we head to Chicago. We'd love to have you with us.